Physical chemistry is the branch of chemistry that studies how matter behaves on a molecular and atomic level and how chemical reactions happen. To understand it deeply first, we need to learn thermodynamics in detail. Thermodynamics is the branch of physical chemistry that deals with the relationships between heat and other forms of energy. To understand thermodynamics in detail, first we need to know what energy transformations actually mean. Actually, energy transformations are the changes of energy from one form to another that occur in every process around us. Thermodynamics is fundamentally based on three major laws and several important concepts. Let's explain each law in detail. First, let's understand the first law of thermodynamics deeply. The first law can be defined as the principle that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only converted from one form to another. To understand this deeply, let's take the example of a car engine. When gasoline burns in the engine, its chemical energy is converted converted into mechanical energy to move the car and heat energy that makes the engine warm. If we could measure all these energy forms precisely, we would find that the total energy remains constant. Now, we will move toward the second law of thermodynamics. The second law can be defined as the principle that states that the entropy of the universe always increases in any spontaneous process. Let's take the example of an ice cube melting at room temperature. When the ice cube melts, the ordered arrangement of water molecules in the solid state becomes more disordered in the liquid state. This process happens spontaneously because it increases the overall entropy. Actually, this is why many processes in nature are irreversible. You can't unmelt an ice cube just by waiting. Moving to the third law of thermodynamics, it can be defined as the principle that states the entropy of a perfect crystal at absolute zero temperature is zero. To understand this deeply, let's look at what happens when we cool substances to very low temperature. Temperatures. As the temperature approaches absolute zero, molecular motion almost stops, and particles arrange themselves in the most ordered way possible. However, it's important to note that reaching absolute zero is impossible. Now let's understand the concept of enthalpy. Enthalpy can be defined as the heat content of a system at constant pressure. To make it clear, let's take the example of boiling water. When we heat water in an open pot at constant pressure, the energy we add increases the water's enthalpy until it reaches its boiling point. During boiling, additional energy goes into changing the water from liquid to vapor without changing its temperature. This is called the enthalpy of vaporization. Moving to Gibbs free energy, this concept helps us predict whether a chemical reaction will occur spontaneously. Let's understand this with a simple example. When we mix vinegar and baking soda, the reaction happens spontaneously because the Gibbs free energy decreases. This decrease in Gibbs free energy is like a ball rolling downhill. It happens naturally without any external push. Now we can explore the concept of heat capacity. Heat capacity can be defined as the amount of heat energy required to raise the temperature of a substance by one degree. To understand it deeply, let's compare water and sand at the beach. Water has a higher heat capacity capacity than sand, which is why the sand gets hot quickly in the sun while the ocean stays relatively cool. Actually, this property of water is crucial for maintaining Earth climate. Let's explain the relationship between work and heat in thermodynamic processes. In thermodynamics, work and heat are two ways of transferring energy between a system and its surroundings. To make it clear, let's look at a bicycle pump. When you compress air in the pump, you're doing work on the system, which increases its temperature. The air then transfers some of this energy as heat to the pump's walls, demonstrating the interconversion between work and heat. Moving to thermodynamic cycles, these are series of processes that begin and end at the same state. To understand this Deeply, let's take the example of a refrigeration cycle. In this cycle, a refrigerant gas is repeatedly compressed, cooled, and allowed to expand and then used to absorb heat from inside the refrigerator. This cycle continuously repeats to keep your food cold. Now let's move toward chemical kinetics. Chemical kinetics is the study of how fast chemical reactions occur and what factors affect these reaction rates. To understand chemical kinetics in detail, first we need to know what actually determines how quickly molecules react. Actually, for a chemical reaction to occur, molecules must collide with enough energy and in the correct orientation. Chemical kinetics can be understood through several key concepts, and they are reaction rate, rate laws, and rate determining factors. Let's explain each concept in detail. First, let's understand reaction rate deeply. Reaction rate can be defined as the speed at which reactants are converted into products. To understand this deeply, let's take the example of iron rusting. When iron reacts with oxygen in the presence of moisture, it forms rust, 
We can measure this reaction rate by determining how much rust forms over a specific time period, just like measuring the speed of a car by seeing how far it travels in a certain time. Now we will move toward rate laws. Rate laws can be defined as mathematical equations that show how the reaction rate depends on the concentration of reactants. Let's take the example of hydrogen peroxide decomposing into water and oxygen. The rate of this decomposition depends on the concentration of hydrogen peroxide. Doubling the concentration might double the rate. Actually, this relationship between concentration and rate is expressed in the rate law, which helps us predict how fast reactions will occur under different conditions. Moving to the factors affecting reaction rates, let's understand each factor deeply. Temperature is one of the most important factors. To make it clear, let's look at what happens when we cook food. When we increase the temperature, food cooks faster because the molecules have more energy and collide more frequently with enough energy to react. This is why we store food in refrigerators. The lower temperature slows down the chemical reactions that cause food to spoil. Now, let's explain concentration effects. Concentration can be defined as the amount of reactant present in a given volume. To understand this deeply, let's take the example of bleach cleaning a stain. When we use concentrated bleach, it cleans faster than diluted bleach because there are more bleach molecules available to collide with the stain molecules. Actually, this is why many cleaning products come in concentrated forms that we dilute before use. Moving to catalyst effects, catalysts can be defined as substances that increase reaction rates without being consumed in the reaction. Let's understand this with the example of the catalytic converter in cars. This device contains platinum and other metals that help break down harmful exhaust gases into less harmful substances much faster than would happen without the catalyst. Interestingly, the catalyst isn't used up in this process, so it can continue working for a long time. Now let's explore activation energy. Activation energy can be defined as the minimum energy needed for a reaction to occur. To understand this deeply, let's compare it to pushing a boulder over a hill. Just as the boulder needs enough initial push to get over the hill, molecules need enough energy to overcome the activation energy barrier and react. Catalysts work by lowering this activation energy, just like creating a tunnel through the hill would make it easier to get the boulder to the other side. Actually, understanding reaction mechanisms is crucial in chemical kinetics. A reaction Reaction mechanism can be defined as the step-by-step -step sequence of elementary reactions that lead to the overall chemical change. To make it clear, let's look at the formation of water from hydrogen and oxygen. This seemingly simple reaction actually occurs through several steps, with each step having its own rate. The slowest step in this sequence becomes the rate-determining step, controlling the overall reaction speed. Moving to collision theory, this helps explain why reactions occur at different rates. To understand collision theory deeply, let's imagine bumper cars at an amusement park. Just as bumper cars need to hit each other with enough energy and at the right angle to create an interesting collision, molecules need to collide with sufficient energy and proper orientation to react. This explains why increasing temperature and concentration speeds up reactions. Now we can move towards chemical equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium is the state where the rates of forward and reverse reactions become equal, resulting in no net change in the concentrations of reactants and products. To understand chemical equilibrium in detail, first we need to know what happens when reactions reach this balanced state. Actually, at equilibrium, reactions don't stop. They continue in both directions at the same rate. Chemical equilibrium can be understood through several fundamental concepts, and they are reversible reactions equilibrium constants, and Le Chatelier's principle. Let's explain each concept in detail. First, let's understand reversible reactions deeply. Reversible reactions can be defined as chemical reactions that can proceed in both forward and backward directions. To understand this deeply, let's take the example of carbonated beverages. When you open a soda can, carbon dioxide dissolves in the water, while simultaneously some carbon dioxide escapes from the solution. Initially, more CO2 escapes than dissolves eventually these rates become equal. Now we will move toward equilibrium constants. The equilibrium constant can be defined as a numerical value that expresses the relationship between product and reactant concentrations at equilibrium. Let's take the example of ammonia formation from nitrogen and hydrogen gases. In this reaction, the equilibrium constant Kc tells us the ratio of ammonia concentration to the concentrations of nitrogen and hydrogen at equilibrium. Actually, a larger equilibrium constant means the reaction favors product formation, while a smaller one indicates more reactants at equilibrium. Moving to Le Chatelier's principle, it can be defined as a principle stating that when a system at equilibrium is disturbed, the system will shift to counteract the disturbance. To make it clear, let's look at what happens in the production of ammonia. If we increase the pressure on the system, it will shift to produce more ammonia because this reduces the number of gas molecules, counteracting the pressure increase. 
Similarly, removing ammonia product causes the system to produce more ammonia to replace what was removed. Now let's explain temperature effects on equilibrium. Temperature changes can shift the position of equilibrium by favoring either the forward or reverse reaction. To understand this deeply, let's take the example of dissolving gases in water. When you heat a carbonated drink, more carbon dioxide escapes because higher temperatures favor the endothermic direction of the reaction. This is why cold sodas stay fizzy longer than warm ones. Moving to pressure effects. Pressure changes can significantly impact equilibrium in reactions involving gases. Let's understand this with the example of ammonia synthesis again. Increasing pressure favors the production of ammonia because the forward reaction reduces the number of gas molecules. Actually, this principle is used in industrial ammonia production to maximize yield. Now we can explore concentration effects on equilibrium. Changes in concentration of any component will cause the system to shift to restore equilibrium. To make it clear, let's look at the reaction of iron ions with thiocyanate ions to form the blood-red iron thiocyanate complex. If we add more iron ions, the solution becomes darker red as the equilibrium shifts to form more product, counteracting the added reactant. Let's explain the concept of equilibrium position. Equilibrium position can be defined as the relative amounts of reactants and products present at equilibrium. To understand this deeply, let's take the example of a swimming pool's chlorination system. The position of equilibrium between chlorine and its ionic forms in water determines the pool's sanitizing effectiveness. pH changes can shift this position, which is why maintaining proper pH is crucial for pool maintenance. Now we can move towards electrochemistry. Electrochemistry is the branch of chemistry that deals with the relationship between electrical and chemical energy. To understand electrochemistry in detail, first we need to know what happens when electrical energy causes chemical reactions or when chemical reactions produce electrical energy. Actually, these processes are happening all around us, from the batteries in our phones to the corrosion of metals. Electrochemistry can be divided into two main types of cells, and they are galvanic cells and electrolytic cells. Let's explain each type in detail. First, let's understand galvanic cells deeply. Galvanic cells can be defined as electrochemical cells that produce electrical energy from spontaneous chemical reactions. To understand this deeply, let's take the example of a simple battery. In a typical alkaline battery, zinc metal reacts with manganese dioxide, creating a flow of electrons through the circuit. Actually, this flow of electrons is what powers our electronic devices. Now, we will move toward electrolytic cells. Electrolytic cells can be defined as electrochemical cells that use electrical energy to drive non-spontaneous chemical reactions. Let's take the example of electroplating silver onto jewelry. When we pass an electric current through a solution containing silver ions, the electrons force the silver to plate onto the jewelry surface. This process is the opposite of what happens in a galvanic cell because it requires electrical energy input. Moving to electrodes, let's understand their role deeply. Electrodes can be defined as the conductors where oxidation and reduction reactions occur in electrochemical cells. To make it clear, let's look at what happens in a rechargeable phone battery. The battery has two electrodes, an anode where oxidation occurs and a cathode where reduction occurs. These electrodes are like the entrance and exit points for electrons in our electrochemical system. Now let's explain oxidation and reduction. Oxidation can be defined as the loss of electrons, while reduction is the gain of electrons. To understand this deeply, let's take the example of iron rusting. When iron rusts, it loses electrons to oxygen while oxygen gains these electrons. This process, called redox, is the basis of many electrochemical reactions. Moving to electrode potentials, these can be defined as the tendency of an electrode to gain or lose electrons. Let's understand this with a practical example. In a car battery, the lead electrode has a different potential than the lead dioxide electrode. Actually, this difference in potential creates the voltage that powers your car's electrical systems. Now we can explore the concept of electrolytes. Electrolytes can be defined as substances that conduct electricity when dissolved in water by breaking into ions. To make it clear, let's Let's look at sports drinks. These beverages contain salts like sodium chloride and potassium chloride that dissolve into ions, making the solution conduct electricity. This is why these drinks can help replace the electrolytes lost through sweating. Let's explain the Nernst equation, which can be defined as a mathematical relationship that relates cell potential to concentration of reactants and products. To understand this deeply, let's look at pH meters. A pH meter uses the Nernst equation to convert the potential difference between its electrodes into a pH reading allowing us to measure the acidity or basicity of solutions. 